Um, so are you with a lot of family right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes? How many people? So there is five people in my family. Okay, cool. This is um, like the basic and- question I learned when I learned English with my teacher. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What you're hearing is a mic check between producer Natalia Ramirez and our guest, a new young immigrant to the U.S. I remember my favorite phrase in, like, whole English language was, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Why was that your favorite? Because it just avoided me from a lot of troubles. Like, my teacher asked me, like, complicated questions, and he just say, I don't know, and then it's done. So I still love it till this day. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, perfect. Um, Now you can uh, stop recording. So when I finally sat down to talk to her, you can go ahead and click record. Okay. Um, Hello, my name is Asina. I first asked Asina Tahir Eastgill, 19 years old, about the things she did not know when she first got here from China four years ago. I don't know what cafeteria means. It was, like, right before lunch, and the teacher was like, okay, kids, let's go to cafeteria and eat your lunch. And I was like, what the hell is cafeteria? <laughs> sounds so fancy to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a French or something. Where are we going now? Yeah, yeah like, expensive, you know? It's like an art gallery or something. <laughs> only thing that I learned from my British English that I learned from my teacher in a year was restaurant. There were a lot of basic words she didn't know. Like, instead of restroom, she would say toilet. Instead of excuse me, she'd say, pardon me. So one day, a girl in front of me, she turned her head back. She looked at me and she's like, hey. I said, hey. And she said, you know you sound like an old lady? And I was like, really? She said, yes. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Asina says she didn't really mind being called an old lady. Because a lot of times in class, she kind of feels like one. When I be friends with my same age kids, I just feel like I'm their grandma. The main thing, keeping Asina from connecting to kids her own age, isn't the stuff she doesn't know. The things they talk about is like TikTok, malls, games. It's that she knows too much. And then the things I think about, it was genocide, it was Uyghurs, it was international policies. All those, you know, like annoying adult facts. Asina knows these annoying adult facts because she's Uyghur. She grew up in Urumqi, a part of Xinjiang, China, where over 12 million Muslims like her are now under extreme surveillance. Human rights groups estimate that over a million have been detained in concentration camps over the past few years. And the U.S., Canada, and the Netherlands have officially called it a genocide. Asina and her family were able to escape four years ago. The whole thing just made me grow up so fast that I had to think a lot of things that in my age, like, it doesn't belong to my age. For years, I've been hearing stories about the Uyghurs in China the ethnic minority group that's been persecuted by the Chinese government. But very few Uyghurs have been able to leave China in the last few years. So it's rare that we hear what's happening there firsthand, much less in English. It's pretty much impossible to escape. I I feel like I'm the only one who's like the most recent here. So this week... The story of one young Uyghur. How she became old before her time in another country. And how she's now trying to make her way here. Where no one her age seems to know the things that she does. I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. A show about our unfinished country. My name, Asina, is a Turkish name. It's a pretty common name in Turkey, according to my dad. It's also a name of like a female wolf who's like a mother of the whole Turkish people. 
So at the time when he named me, he wanted me to remember that we are from Turkey. Asina grew up among many Uyghurs in a part of China, Xinjiang, that used to be Turkish. We called Xinjiang East Turkestan here just because it's what it named before. But growing up in China, she didn't learn much about her own people. The history we learn is the Chinese history, their dynasties. I still love it till these days. I still watch movies about it. I still read books about it. It's so beautiful. But they've never taught us about our own culture. In her classroom in Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang, where most of the kids were Uyghur, the only Uyghur history they got was a few paragraphs long. My Chinese textbook from first grade had like a couple articles introducing Uyghurs. Basically what they introduced is our region is pretty good region to grow fruits. We have a lot of good fruits and veggies. And the people there is friendly, optimistic. Every single person knows how to sing and dance. <laughs> Little fairies in like a land of fruits and veggies. <laughs> that, that's what they imagined. And I was like, they don't know anything about Uyghurs. We're not like that. My dad doesn't know how to dance. <laughs> we, don't, we don't dance around a fire. It's like we did, but like it's a couple decades ago. <laughs> the understanding is not deep. And I'm pretty sure they don't want it to be deep. Growing up surrounded by Uyghurs, this never really bothered Asina very much. It was only when she left Arumchi. You go to places that there's only Han Chinese people that lives. They literally just see you like a foreigner. She remembers one trip her family took to Beijing. We took a train and it was like a pretty happy moment because I can eat whatever snack I want. What did you eat? Oh, oh my god, I ate a lot of trash food. <laughs> Instant noodles, I ate all those like spicy little snacks. <laughs> it's been a, like a trash food three days for me. Like a bender. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They basically don't have any halal foods in train. That's why my mom just brought me a lot of snacks. Because your mom normally wants you to have halal foods? Yeah, for sure. We're Muslims, we have to eat halal foods. And then... A pretty, really, really nice Chinese woman compliment me. (laughs) She's like, you're so pretty. (laughs) That's why I thought she's nice. Mm -hmm. And then she told us that she didn't even know the difference between like ethnic minorities in China. And the media taught them that the Uyghurs or other ethnic minorities is basically like, I don't know how to say that word, but... A brutal, yes, really brutal, religious, extreme people, but V seems good. A lot of Chinese people had never traveled to Xinjiang and they just believed the medias and the knowledge that they got from pretty old textbooks. They just describe us as like fruit eating. Dancing, singing, optimistic, brutal, religious, ethnic minority that, you know, like, dance around a fire. <laughs> that, that was their stereotype, and she told me that, pretty honest. I wasn't surprised. We just laugh. We don't do anything else. It's just this insecurity it just makes you feel like you don't belong to this country. They literally like introducing you like a alien or something. <laughs> we got used to it, to be honest. We got used to all these small discriminations, all those small stereotypes, all those small things. We got used to it. At least I thought it was pretty normal back then. It, it hurts, but it's like a little bit. It's not much. But the things they did afterwards was terrifying and it's basically a genocide. The first big turning point for Uyghurs who had lived peacefully in China came when Asina was just eight years old. I was too little to understand what happened at that time. In June 2009, in a factory in eastern China, 
rumors flew around that Uyghur workers had raped two Han Chinese workers. As a result of these baseless rumors, Han workers lynched several Uyghur co-workers. This sparked protests in Urumqi, Asina's hometown. The protests were peaceful, but soon turned violent after police suppressed them. My mom and my grandma, they were going to a wedding at the exact day of July 5th. And they left me and my sister to our like pretty close neighbor. So we were on uh, outside of our neighborhood and buying groceries in a, like a small store on, on the roadside. But then suddenly a young guy from that store, he was like outside and he just ran into the store and he was like, something bad happened over there. That's what he said. And then I saw it too. People literally screaming with stakes and stuff. They're like hitting each other. You can see it from really far. It was really, really terrifying. It was like the screamings and stuff. It was like a war, small war happening over there. At least 197 people were left dead from the violence. A couple hours later, I guess, my mom and my grandma came back. They saw the whole thing. They looked terrified. And they came back to our house and sit down, drink water. And they just can't speak for like a long time. And I was small, but I can't feel like, you know, it's a pretty bad situation. The violence made international news and heralded a new era in the Chinese relationship to the Uyghur people. From then on, the government would watch them closely. Did you understand what was happening was because you were Uyghur and because it was about your identity? Yes. How did you know that? It was so obvious. (laughs) We knew just from our nature. It was just something that's in your blood and your bones and you know that they don't like you and they discriminate you. Yeah, what what do you mean that you know it in your bones? Like, what is that feeling? Mm. It's basically like you are a drop of oil, but you are in a cup of water. (laughs) You are like both liquids, both humans, but you can just never actually get into them. You can't just put yourself into that water. After the violence of 2009, Asina's childhood was relatively peaceful. But in the background, clashes between Uyghurs and the government continued, and tension kept growing. Mostly in subtle ways that Asina never noticed, until 2017. The first side of the things getting bad was they started to build brand new small police stations, like a small box in every 100 meters of our city. It's weird. I used to walk to school. It literally takes me like 10 minutes to go walk to my school. And in every quiet mornings that I walk by myself, I saw tanks with like five, six soldiers standing on a tank and looking at me when I walked past them. I I knew things... Are, are are really, really, really bad. What what were people saying about this change? Let me tell you something. Um, you know the cable in the house? Mm-hmm. They installed so many cameras. They did fingerprint checkers and all the stuff in every single part of our lives that a lot of Uyghurs start to believe that the cables have like chips or something that can record what we're saying. So my dad and my mom, they didn't believe it, but they still didn't talk about politics at home. You can tell how terrified we are. We, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't even talk about it. We were just like forced to get used to it. And no one could actually like stood up and say, hey, what you guys doing? We're not prisoners, but like no one. Not even the brave ones, not even the intellectuals. 
because they were all in camps. By 2017, Uyghurs had started to disappear, one by one. The Chinese government had taken them away to camps. Yeah, they first targeted the religious people, and a lot of my my dad's religious friends got in there. If you look really religious, if you look really Uyghur, and especially when you are a male, they will definitely think you are suspicious. What suspicious? What is the suspicion? What are they suspecting? The suspecting is um, that you are a religious person and you are trying to divide the country. They start to put people in inside those camps in the name of studying. The government called the camps study centers. An official word from Beijing was that people were going there voluntarily for re-education. They said, we are teaching them. They said they have to learn Chinese language. They have to learn all the skills. And then they're going to like put them back in the society after they finish learning. That's what they said in the beginning. But as the months passed, people didn't seem to be coming back. More and more people were carted away to camp. Intellectuals, my dad's friends, they started to disappear. It's estimated that more than one million Uyghurs have been put in these camps. Human rights groups and several governments say that at these camps, the Chinese government is forcibly sterilizing Uyghur women. I remember once when I was in my classroom, we had cameras in classrooms, every single classrooms. One of my classmates started to crying out of sudden. He said his dad was in camps. At that time, at least one relative or one friend from each family was in camps. So the whole classroom just started to begin crying. And then my biology teacher, he stepped into the classroom, he looked at us, and then he grabbed the blackboard wipe, and he covered the camera on the back door of our classroom. He knew that the things he's going to talk about is going to make him in a big trouble. What did he say? So he said, don't cry. I know that the situation is bad, but we can't let them see our tears. He said, you young people, you teenagers are the hope for Uyghurs. You guys can't be freaked out. You guys have to stand up and be brave. That's what he said. And then a couple weeks later, he disappeared from school. And then we got the information that he is in a jail, like in a camp. In a study camp. In a study camp. That's my last time seeing him. Watching their friends being taken off to camp, Asina and her family were terrified. And Asina looked to her dad for answers about what was going on. My father is a poet and writer and a film director and my idol. Asina's father, Tahir Hamut Iskil, is a famous Uyghur poet and an activist. He'd been politically active for most of his life. He helped organize hunger strikes and marches during the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. And in 1996, after he applied to study abroad in Turkey, he was tortured and then imprisoned on charges of exposing state secrets. He spent three years in a forced labor camp where conditions were harsh and he lost 100 pounds. After that, he started over, building a career as a filmmaker and a poet in Xinjiang. So he's like my idol. He's, he's really experienced and something I really respect. What is your favorite poem of your dad's? Do you have a favorite one? I used to have one. Oh, yeah? What was it? So I don't know how did they translate it to English in exactly like uh, the words, but it's called Men Ulgenda. If I translate it here, it's like when I die. Hmm. Do you remember it in, in Uyghur? Yes. Men Ulgenda. Men Ulgenda, Bayrakongni Chirmayerim, 
Mangu mansub tenha yoklush. And I forgot. <laughs> what is that? What does that mean? It's basically like uh, he was saying, "When I die, don't be sad and don't lower your flags." It's basically like uh, I deserve a lonely death. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like it. What do you like about it? It's just so lonely. You can feel the motion, and I can tell my dad was lonely at that time. And I know it was like the hardest moments of his life. So I can feel the motions. Asina's dad saw what was happening in Xinjiang, and believed it wouldn't be long before he too would be sent to the camps. He knows everything. He was so smart that he already smelled that the danger is coming. So he started looking for ways to get his family out of the country, which proved very difficult. When he finally got a passport, they couldn't get a visa. And when they got a visa... They took our passports away. So he didn't sleep for a whole night. And he searched online that which kind of illness that... Chinese people will go treat in the United States. It's epilepsy. So my dad said, I have epilepsy. And we have to come to the United States to do it. They even got three medical professionals to help make the epilepsy look legit. You know, in China, um, you can basically do everything with money. (laughs) If you have money, you you can do anything. You can fake anything. And then they had to wait. So, like, a couple last months from our escape, to the United States, my dad, he's basically like a ghost. <laughs> he was just like eating and he just goes out to walk around and even run. He never exercised, but he just can't relieve the emotion in his heart. It was, it was desperate. It just makes us so tired. When you are in that situation, you don't even want to think anymore. Did you see him as your hero during this time, during that kind of desperate time? I thought I was I was his hero. <laughs> I tried my best to make him feel better. I was really afraid that his mental health. You know, in this situation, there's no hero. It feels like the death is like coming closer and closer to him every day. Because every person that got into camps around him is related to him and he knows that he can't escape. I didn't think, you know, like, he's not brave. I didn't think he's not strong. I just, I feel sad for him, and I tried my best to make him feel better. During this time, all the family could do was wait. At that time, I hated the place. When I walk in the streets, I hate it, and I just can't wait to escape. That was my thought. I look at the soldiers, and I look at, the street, I look at the whole city that raised me, and I hated the city. And I I was just, I just felt sad for them. Because I know the situation is going to get worse. Then, after months and months of trying to get out of the country, Asina and her parents and her little sister made it to the airport. When we, like, passed through the security points in the airport, and this whole process, you know, like, Going from my house to the airport, these like spy movies you have. <laughs> I felt excited, to be honest. <laughs> my parents were like freaked out, they're afraid, uh, but I was like excited because I like airplanes. <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah, 16 hours of airplane. <laughs> but then, after a couple hours of excitement, um, there's like an empty feeling in all of our. Hearts, I guess. It just feels like you escaped from your own, own homeland. You lived there, especially for my parents. They lived there for like 40, 45 years. And they're like going to a new, brand new country that they only saw them movies before, you know? So it just, you don't know what to do. It's just, it's unknown. The future is unknown. And, um, n- it was a complicated feeling. We just sat there like quietly for like hours thinking about our own future. Except my sister, she was sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) 
it was all those unknown, worried, panic feelings. And then when I step out of the plane and I see all those people, it's just disappeared at one single moment. It was like I'm in a garden. <laughs> I still dream about it sometimes in my dreams. Really? Yeah. What, does, what do you dream about? Like when I see like a bunch of Americans, they're so colorful. All the ethnicities you can find in the world. <laughs> All the colors of hairs, skins, all the heights, all the weights, all the genders, colors, all the weird clothing, <laughs> difference. It's just make it so beautiful. It feels like I'm in a garden with all the colors of flowers. <laughs> when I see all those people, I feel like, hey, you see all those colored people here. They look like they're fine, they're leaving here, and they're fine all together, so I guess I'm going to be fit in here too. Oh, my brother is crying. Can you hear him? Or no? Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Okay, is he doing I should, okay? <laughs> I should change my location. Oops. Asina starts a new life after the break. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. Hello? I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. And we're back with the story of Asina Tahir Iskil. Hello. Hi. We lost you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I changed my location. Just the way is everything my okay? brothers... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just crying. Back out. in 2017, Asina's father's plan to escape finally worked. She, her parents, and her sister finally boarded a plane to the United States. I got here, stepped out of the airplane, and I saw that Starbucks... <laughs> and the Starbucks look amazing. It smells amazing. It smells so expensive. <laughs> it smells fancy. So I went in there and I bought a cup of coffee. It's like a random, ordinary coffee, nothing fancy. And I drink it. I don't like coffee. I don't like coffee till now. But that coffee tastes so good. It tastes like upper class. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm rich now, you know? Like, I feel like I can go back to my class and tell them that I had the Starbucks and they must be jealous. That was my first thought. I was happy, excited for a couple minutes, thinking about, you know, like the images of going back and tell them I drink Starbucks. And then out of sudden, I realized impossible. And then I realized... I had the Starbucks, and I might have it, like, every single day of my life for next years. But they can't. So I just, I, I was not happy anymore. Every time, the feel of guiltiness is that when you try something new and when you eat something good, the only thing is that after, like, short terms of happiness, the thing left in your mind is... They should try this too. Like, why Why am I the one who is enjoying it? What, what did I do? I don't deserve this, you know? I should stay with my, with my people. I should stay with my relatives and I should stay with my classmates. And I don't deserve this beautiful life here. But slowly, Asina tried to adjust to life in the United States. She was the only one in her family who knew English, so she had to act as their translator, helping them find a new apartment, find the cheapest groceries, stuff normally adults would do. All while she tried to adjust to American high school. I didn't like the kids in my school. I thought they're immature. I even blamed them for not knowing what's happening in my homeland. I compared them to my classmates, 
or have to see their parents in camps or in jails. So I just kind of hate them too. I, I hate them being like so ignorant, not knowing what's going on. Like things are really bad in, in corners of the world, but you guys here just like doesn't know anything and having a really, really good life that we can't imagine. It's like not knowing here is like this luxury. It's like being spoiled to not know about these things happening in the world. Yeah. When, when the kids in my classroom talk bad things about the government, the America society, I feel really angry. No, I was not born here, but I love this country like more than anyone in, this, in the classroom. They never know how lucky they are. And they never know how things can get really bad in other countries. But here they're safe. They even have the freedom, you know, to talk bad things about the government and stuff. We can't even talk about it in our own, own house. They can do it in classrooms and they can debate about it. I felt like they don't know how to appreciate the country. But now I realize it's a good thing. What do you mean? For the people to have thoughts, to have debates, to think in opposite views, and not only just compliment the government and compliment society, especially for young people, I guess it's a good thing. I mean, I can't be the lover, you know? <laughs> I can't be the one that <laughs> who compliments every side. And they can be the one that who can see the um, bad sides. And we can work together and make this place a better country. But I still think they should appreciate. You know, they should at least appreciate <laughs> big soccer fields and the basketball fields. It's expensive. <laughs> so, and the whole like American life feels like a dream for us. It was so unreal. I realized that, you know, after escaping here, you know, every single one in the family felt some sense of guiltiness. Is there another life you imagine for yourself? that would take away the guilt? Like, what, what do you wish you could do? At that time, to be honest, it's a pretty dark thought, but I, I wished I could die. Die in, like, a way that everybody knows what's going on in Xinjiang. I just wanted to rescue my people. Like, you wished you could die and kind of save all of them from yes. that pain? If I go back and died in a way that it's beneficial for my people, I feel like this guiltiness will go away. That was my thought. Have your thoughts changed? Yes. One day in a February 2019, when I got back from school, sitting on a couch, and my mom said to me that she's pregnant. I was like 18 and I'm 18, I'm going to have a baby brother. <laughs> and I was shocked. <laughs> I was like, I was shocked. <laughs> I've been through so much with my parents, you know. I've survived like a genocide. So I was like, sit on the couch for like literally hours, like thinking through in my mind. <laughs> what did you say to your mom? I said no. I said definitely no. No. But she obviously didn't listen to me. And she was mad at me. I was mad at her. I was mad at her that she's not responsible to herself. And she tried to give birth in such an old age. I want my mom. I don't want a new brother. That was my thought. And she was mad at me that I was so cold blood that I didn't want a baby. <laughs> so we had a couple days of Cold War. <laughs> But then I had to go take an appointment for a doctor to go to ultrasound. I gave up. So <laughs> I apologize after thinking through it a couple of days. You know, it's her choice. I can't, I can't change her decision. So I realized that we definitely need something that we can take care of and, you know, like distract us from the emotions. So I thought my brother is a good choice. And it ended up I was right. No one can think of anything <laughs> except, like, taking care of baby when they're taking care of baby. 
<laughs> it's so distracting. <laughs> but when I take my baby brother to like playgrounds and stuff, everybody look at me and I'm pretty sure they think I'm a teen mom. And I'll accept it, you know. <laughs> I can't die now. I have a baby. <laughs> I'm a teen mom. I have to take care of my baby. <laughs> he basically saved us from our bad mental health situation because you can't die, you know, with a baby. It's, it's, it's not good. You have to live for them. So you said if my thoughts have changed, I'll say now, like, it changed. I don't want to go do a pointless death. I want to spread this story. I want to be successful, as my biology teacher said. It might not be helpful if I was back in China, but now I'm here. And I hope, I hope it works. <laughs> I hope I can do the things that my biology teacher said. No. You be the the hope of the Uyghur people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be the hope of the Uyghur people. <laughs> By teaching my brother and <laughs> stuff. <laughs> always remembering the responsibility. And always keep this guilty feeling. Always keep it? Yeah, always keep it. I don't wanna I don't wanna forget it. It's painful, but I think I have to keep it. Mm. I wanna I want to feel guilt. I want to I want to help my people. I want to always remember this, but I also want to enjoy my own life, you know. It's so interesting like just listening. It's just really powerful and I feel really grateful that you're like sharing so much with me and my parents were actually born in Cuba. Um, they came from a communist government there. And reading your dad's work and listening to you talk, it actually reminds me a lot of stories my family's told, you know, about the experience of being under a communist government, the fear, the mistrust, these neighborhood committees that would check up on each other. And my grandfather always talked about how he wished he had stayed, how he wished he could have made the country better instead of like coming to this country. It's like <laughs> this country kind of had it figured out in his mind, you know, yeah. America <laughs> had it figured out. And so he wished that he had been brave enough to do something in Cuba, you know? And it's so interesting because, you know, I don't know, I guess, like, if you have a daughter, that would be, like, my generation. You were actually the same age that my dad was when he came. And and I'm American now, so you kind of adjust to a new country. You let go of the guilt. You just look forward because I guess that's all you can do. I don't really have a point, but that, that was my... <laughs> that was, that, that's what I've been thinking about. Um, yeah. Do you... Do you have hopes for like your, I don't know, if you have a daughter, <laughs> what you what you would want as she lives in this country? My brother, my brother born, hmm. we have like a special event. So basically what they do is like they put him in a bathtub and then like little kids come over and then they pour like one spoon of water on him and then saying good wishes. My parents invited like five, six kids around, like Uyghur kids, you know. <laughs> and then they pour the water and they tell him to be rich, to be a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> they said all kinds of successful lives, to be a doctor, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And then when it's my turn, I, I grab a spoon of water and I pour it on him. And I said, I hope you become a free person. That was my thought. I just want him to have, like, a freedom. My dad struggled almost his whole life looking for freedom. And he finally got it when he's, like, 50s. And I hope my brother, he can be free forever. But I know it's hard for him to escape this identity as Uyghur. I think about it all the time. That if it's fair, like, fair to, you know, like, let him get all those memories and give him this, like, 
this um, hard responsibility. Like, give him this identity, the whole Uyghur identity. I don't know if it's fair for him, but... What do you mean? Like, um, I don't know. I just want him to have the choice. I just want him to have the choice to choose if he wants to be Uyghur. Choose if he wants to, you know, get all those genocide, all those bad things from, from our memories. You want to give him the luxury of not knowing. Yeah. But, like I mentioned, it's in our bones and bloods. We can't escape it. Then I realize he, he has to. He has to be a Uyghur. His name is Tarim. My dad gave him this name, and Tarim is like a mother reaver of our homeland. Is it what? It's like a mother reaver, so... Basically, it's like the river that raised us. That's what Uyghurs say. The the river that raised us? Yeah. It's a big river you now in Xinjiang. And basically, Uyghurs lived in Xinjiang because of that river, I guess. It's, you know, all civilizations start with the water. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, his name is Tarim. And my dad and my mom, they don't want him to forget he's Uyghur. And... They have hopes for him you know, to at least not forget where he's from. I feel like he's going to struggle a lot in the future and I have to help him. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be like, what the hell is Uyghur? And I'm going to explain to him. And he's like, okay, what does it look like? I have to tell him that we dance, we sing, you know, around the fire. <laughs> we have veggies and fruits. <laughs> yeah, I have to buy that textbook from eBay or something. <laughs> if they send it here, you know, I have to show him, like, this is Uyghurs. <laughs> Okay, uh, my dad is out here. I guess our time's up. Do you want to talk to him, though? He can say hi. Yeah, I would love to say hi. Okay. Baba, my dad loves interviewers. Okay, you can say hello, Julia. Hello. Hello, this is Tahir. Hi. Hi, Tahir. This is Julia Longoria from The Atlantic. Thank you so much um, hi, for... Yeah, it's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> well, your daughter is really incredible. She's been telling me all about her experience, and she's, I, I know you know she's wise beyond her years. <laughs> um, it's been so such a privilege to talk to her. So um, you raised a pretty uh, incredible person. I <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, would you ask him if he could remember any of that poem? Maybe you could start it off for him and yeah. maybe it'll jog his memory. Oh, yes. He wrote a poem with my name. It's called Asina. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I forgot what about he... that poem. Totally. <laughs> would, he, would he recite it? He saw his mom here. Okay, so we're gonna. My dad said it's totally fine for him to recite it. So okay, later today we're gonna. We'll do it later. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. All right. Well, enjoy your vacation. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And, uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye. Asina Güşümnün bir parçası üzüp ilinğan Sönükümnün bir parçası sundur ilinğan Cenimnün bir parçası küçür ilinğan İdiyemnün bir parçası müstakil boğan Uruk kollarda vaqtının sızıqları yoğunaydı Kapkarı közlerde taş pütüklerinin mənirleri leyleydi 
inçki boyunu da bir tal zulmet kılı çekildi. Karamtul terisi de meyvelerinin xaricisi sızıldı. O, mənzimki çüşken bir tamcı yamğur. Süzüklükidin közümki körün meydağın kelgüsüm kəbi. O, yeşil işi bir hacet tügün, asmandın ekip çüşken qinimnin formulası dek, tarıqtın sırgıp çıkan bir şaret. O, kabremdeki taşını sövgücü, cəsitimini besip doğan, mini ana amanet koyup. O, bəxtsiz bir əbsun, mini yaratkıcığa aylan doğan, həm yaralmışımını dağımlaş doğan. O, minin kızım. This episode was produced by Julia Longoria, with help from Gabrielle Berbe and editing by Catherine Wells and Emily Botin. Fact check by Yvonne Rolshausen. Sound design by David Herman, with additional engineering by Joe Plord. Translations by Joshua L. Freeman. Music by Tasty Morsels. Our team also includes Natalia Ramirez and me, Tracy Hunt. You can read work by Asina's father, the poet Tahir Hamut Izgil, titled One by One, My Friends Were Sent to the Camps, and more on the Uyghurs in China on our website, www. TheAtlantic.com backslash experiment. If you're enjoying this podcast, please spread the word, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. The experiment will be taking a two-week summer break and will return with new episodes starting September 9th. Happy summer. The experiment is a co-production of The Atlantic and WNYC Studios. Thank you for listening.